Hello there. I'm Ken Benoit. I'm the director of the Data Science Institute, and it's my great pleasure this evening to be announcing the official public launch of the LSE's Data Science Institute, or as we call it, the DSI. We have a panel of esteemed experts tonight who are going to talk as part of our roundtable with me um, on the Data, on data science and the future of social science, and we're going to commence that event shortly. But before we do, I want to say a few words of introduction for the Data Science Institute and tell you a little bit about what it is, which hopefully you know some of, but I would like to introduce it formally because this is our launch event. The DSI is designed to be the cornerstone of the LSE's institutional strategy in data science. We're designed to support and to coordinate data science across the school. This is vital because there is no single social science discipline that has been untouched by this revolution in data science. Data science is transforming not just our academic fields, but also every aspect of the economy and the public sector. As we focus on tonight's roundtable, as we will focus on in tonight's roundtable, there is a unique role for LSE as one of the world's leaders in studying the social sciences. There's a role for us to lead in the application of data science to the study of the social world. This is a role that lies at the center of our priorities for the future and at the center um, of part of our 2030 plan that you may have heard of. So tonight is our public launch, but the DSI didn't begin today. It began two years ago in September 2020. And as we know, that was not a time when we would be doing much of public launching of anything. But it also was a time when we had uh, a, a very small staff. I think the N was one. And then very shortly after that, um, it was two. And then it started to grow. And now we're up to about eight. And we have plans to hire another, um, hopefully, half dozen people by this time next year. So the growth has been very rapid. Now, when we launched or when we started, um, it was a time when staff and students weren't even permitted to come to campus. And then during certain periods, we weren't even permit, permitted to leave our homes. So it was born in a unique era in, in, in history, really. We could say that without exaggeration. Since that time, we've been slowly building our institute and we've been recruiting staff, we've been creating our infrastructure, and we've been expanding our activities. So I'm going to tell you very briefly about the sort of things that we do. First of all, let me say that the DSI is not the only place or even we could say the primary source of data science research and teaching at LSE. Those activities are being led primarily by our very impressive researchers and teachers, especially in three departments, statistics, methodology, and mathematics. Think of the DSI more like an amplifier and a set of speakers. But the music itself, that signal is coming from those departments and the other departments around the school, but very primarily in data science, core data science from those three departments. We have an impressive group of researchers and teachers in those departments and throughout the school, but especially in mathematics, statistics and methodology. So our amplification role is through public events like the one that we're doing this evening, where we've assembled this expert group to discuss the relationship between data science and the social sciences and its future. Through our public events, our role is to basically represent data science at the LSE and to channel this into um, a way that amplifies what these departments are doing. We saw this today at our lightning talks, for example. We heard from researchers throughout departments across the school, including departments that you wouldn't no normally associate with data science, such as philosophy. They gave lightning talks before a packed room of students in a medium-sized um, auditorium where we got to see a little bit of the brilliant research that's being done by these departments. We plan at the DSI to lead research and dissemination through supporting things like cloud computing for data science research. And if you're one of our LSE researchers, I can tell you we have not one, but two systems coming very, very soon that we'll be talking about um, internally. We also intend to provide innovative research facilities like a data visualization studio in our new quarters where we should be moving to by the end of this term. And those quarters will be on the first floor of Columbia House where the old director it used to be. But I insisted first on an extensive remodeling. <laughs> We aim to also bring a team science way of working 
to the social sciences. What does that mean? Well, our colleagues, for example, at Imperial College London have been working in teams with engineering and scientific fields for a long time. And this involves people who specialize. People might specialize in data. Someone might specialize in the research computing aspect or the technical aspects or someone who's an expert in getting the data and transforming it. Then you've got the people that lead the project. Having these come together as a project working on a lab based model is a very productive model, but it's not something that's very common to the social sciences. This is something that we plan to lead on at Data Science Institute with, um, for example, hiring a research engineer, hiring a research project manager to help projects move along. We are also very proud to support our brilliant students at the LSE. Um, the Data Science Society of the Student Union um, is a society that we work closely with to support events such as hackathons. Um, we also have a careers in data science series where we provide industry leaders an opportunity to come to LSE and talk to students about what it's like when they recruit people for their data science teams. This pulls back the curtain, if you want to use the Wizard of Oz metaphor, to show them behind the scenes what the fantastic places um, look like in the real world that have a role for data science. These events also represent the events that we sponsor, the DSI's effort to reach out to the wider data science ecosystem beyond the walls of academia, because outreach is a very important part of our goal too. So it's not just limited to academia, but also encompasses government and industry. The series that we have for outreach is going to be something that we're going to continue to work with very closely with LSE organizations such as LSE Careers, LSE Generate, LSE Research and Innovation, and Halton Street Ventures. Let me just give you a few statistics for the events that we've held. For example, our research seminar series. We hold a fortnightly seminar series online, which is a multi-site seminar series. The one that we had last week had over 150 participants. And this is still on Zoom, right? This is something that's pretty pretty good accomplishment for people who are as fatigued at Zoom as, um, as I know I am. Our student events are well attended. We had over 100 persons, 100 people attend in person at the Data Science Weekend in 2022 that we, well, we sponsored. Um, we offer undergraduate modules. In this education sphere, we have three undergraduate modules that we offer with the DSI code, which is very rare for institutes to be doing that at the undergraduate level. Um, we have over 100 students signed up for these three modules just in this term. So that's just a little bit of the statistics that I could be citing to you. I'm not going to do that all, long, be, all night long because we have this wonderful roundtable assembled. But if you're interested in what we're doing, I encourage you to check out the website. We work very hard on making it complete and representative of what we do and our research priorities. You can also sign up to our newsletter and our bulletin. If you're here, my guess is you probably already are signed up. There's one more very important thing I should say. We have to express a very important uh, statement of gratitude to Stuart Roden, a member of our council and an LSE alumnus for a very generous gift that he and his family have made. They have pledged 3.7 million pounds to the DSI, which enabled us in our second phase of growth to consolidate the infrastructure and to facilitate things like I just told you about the visualization observatory and the cloud computing and hiring the new staff. This visionary philanthropic gift is going to enable the DSI to bring together our expertise and knowledge to shape the global data science debate and to put the focus on creating societal impact. It's going to transform the school's teaching and research. It's going to help us to continue to embed data science across the key areas of our work and to confront the big societal challenges that the hard data sciences and technology and research alone cannot resolve. That brings us to tonight's public event and our round table. The theme of this round table is data science and the future of social sciences. How has data science, when applied to the study of human affairs, transformed the study of the social sciences? Data science needs the domain knowledge and the scientific rigor from the social sciences to provide useful, valid, and ethically sound insights. Conversely, social science needs to learn the tools and the methods 
from the emerging fields of data science to, in order to study data, big data, in all of its rich forms. This is crucial to the social sciences remaining relevant in the 21st century. What do we mean by social sciences, just so we're clear? We mean all of the fields of the study of human behavior. We don't just mean sociology. We don't, and we're not excluding economics. We mean political, economic, social, psychological, behavioral, and even ethical and philosophical fields. In other words, the fields whose study is led by the London School of Economics and Political Science. In this brilliant panel, we have assembled a collection of authorities from across the board in data science, including industry, including academia, economic policy, market regulation, and health policy. We're going to explore the theme of data science and the future of the social sciences and how this is both an opportunity and a challenge for future social science and what this entails. That's all that I'm going to speak except to moderate a discussion and we are going to leave plenty of time for audience questions as well, including from our, audi our audience uh, joining us live streamed on YouTube, which Dave is going to monitor and feed to me as questions later on um, in the session. And after that, we have a wonderful reception that we hope you'll stay around for. So what I'm going to do at this stage is I'm going to ask each participant to do a brief self introduction. And I'd like you to focus on the question of what was your pathway to data science? And how are the social sciences part of that? We can start with you, Helen. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I've had quite a hybrid career, um, the sort that needs a really rigorous uh, post hoc rationalization to make any sense. Um, I'll just speed through that. So there's quite a few U turns on the way. So, my first degree is in mathematics. I worked in computing for a few years in the private sector. I then did a U turn and went kind of back to school, as it were. I came here. I did a master's degree and a PhD, and I worked here for a few years at the same time as doing my PhD. As as a political scientist, basically. Um, I've worked at Birkbeck, UCL, and now Oxford, where, where I still am, where I hold the chair in society and the internet at the, at the Oxford Internet Institute, which is a multidisciplinary department of the university looking at the social implications of the internet. And I wrote my PhD in a long running research specialism is in the relationship between technology and government and politics. A lot of my work is about that. So obviously when data science came along, I was really excited um, for kind of both the themes of this panel. Um, I was excited about what data science could do for social science, because over the years I'd realized that particularly my own discipline of political science really didn't have very much data. At least it had data, it had survey data about what people think and what they think they might do, but it didn't have much transactional data, real-time transactional data. And here was a possibility that that could all change. And then I was I, I, at around uh, around the, the time, it's a few years ago now, it's about five or six years ago, um, the idea of the Alan Turing Institute was mooted. That's the National Institute for Data Science and AI. Um, and that's a partnership between government and a number of universities and now really moving towards the whole university sector, including um, the LSE. And when the Alan Turing Institute was announced, I realised that it, Oxford was a very early partner in the Turing Institute. And I realised that it was just going to be statisticians, mathematicians, um, engineers and computer scientists and social science was never mentioned. Um, and I felt that that was not a good state of affairs. So I kind of became involved right from the very beginning. And I set up something called the Public Policy Programme at the Turing Institute. And we are the kind of core of computational social science there. Um, we work with all sorts of um, government organisations, including, <laughs> including um, Stephens. Uh, we work with a lot of regulators. We work with government departments. And we try and work out ways that data science and, and artificial intelligence can kind of help make better public policy, make better governance, uh, design better governance, some better institutions, better public services, and so on. There's a, quite a lot of us now, we're quite a big team. We do a lot of different things for ourselves. Thank you very much, Helen. Caroline. Crikey, follow that. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm in the, my name is Caroline Gorski, I am the CEO of R Squared Factory, which has spun out of Rolls-Royce, um, and we, uh, for the last five or six years, have been internal to Rolls-Royce as the 
artificial intelligence and machine learning capability, helping to transform that big engineering organization into a, a business that's fit for purpose for the next 130 years, building on its 130 year history. Uh, we're now taking some of the capabilities that we've developed over those last five years and, and making them available uh, to other industrial organizations who are interested in how practically and really they unlock value from the application of machine learning and AI to industrial use cases. Um, and in some ways, I feel quite uh, in a familiar position in this room in that I'm having to explain why I'm qualified to have this conversation. Well, then normally I have to explain why as an arts graduate with a degree in modern history and English literature, which is obviously a great qualification for a lifetime in technology, um, I should be talking to nuclear physicists and aerospace engineers and mathematicians and statisticians and other extremely numerous and bright individuals, many of whom are in my team, uh, and, and why, you know, somebody with a background in history should be thinking about leading uh, a group of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning engineers. In this case, obviously, I'm needing to explain why I'm not a statistician or a sociologist or <laughs> coming from the social sciences. Um, but the reality is, we are standing on the cusp of probably the biggest transformational change in socio-industrial experience that we will have seen for the last 250 odd years. Um, and some of the things that we're looking at doing and some of the ways that we're looking at how machine learning and AI augments human intelligence in particularly in industrial processes is genuinely transformational. And we need to have both uh, an eye for the technical questions. We need to have really great data scientists. We need to have really great social scientists. And I would hate, not hesitate to say we need some very good historians who can actually look back at how some of the upheavals we saw collectively across the world over the last 250 years played out in our societies to help us think about how we might manage some of the change that we're about to come up to in the next 50 or so years. Thank you very much. Stefan. Thank you. Um, so actually very interesting to hear, uh, Helen, how I didn't realise you started out mathematics as well. Well, actually that was my uh, original background, but also then quantitative uh, experimental psychology. Um, and then I ended up working in strategy consulting, um, which was less fulfilling than I hoped. Uh, and I came to realise that we were making lots and lots of money in financial services. We were making lots and lots of money with our financial services uh, because uh, people we were selling these products who just clearly didn't understand the products, and that's why we could charge such uh, eye-watering sums. Um, and so I, I was like quantitative, and I wanted to be able to work on social issues, which for me took me to the social sciences, that took me to economics uh, for a sort of master's, also at LSE, uh, and then, uh, then on to a PhD in postdoc. Um, but uh, and then building on the experience I've had in the um, private sector, um, you know, um, wanted to move into regulation, start applying some of the things I'd seen, building up abilities to understand uh, what was happening in markets. So a lot of that was building in um, uh, psychology and the behavioural sciences into economics and just making sure we had a much more um, uh, deeper and more true understanding of consumers and their capabilities. But another aspect of that was starting to build in the... Um, uh, quantitative capabilities to really make sure that we understood what was going on in markets as well. So Richard, initially it was through the, through the lens of uh, economics, but given was some pretty big data sets. So I was at the Financial Conduct Authority and there were big clumps of data which broadly the organisation was not doing very much with uh, and there was just a huge opportunity to go in and start. So for example, all equity debt and equity and debt derivatives, the FCA would have a copy of all of the transactions um, which would be, uh, back then, it was all of magnitude, sort of um, 20, 25 billion, uh, million a day. Uh, so lots, but this was data that was mostly not being used to understand these markets, for example. Uh, and so we started realising this capability to bring in uh, rigorous analytics. And that's when I came across uh, machine learning. So actually one of my advisors in my PhD uh, was on the young vanguard of starting to build machine learning into economics. And we started seeing fantastic opportunities to do that within the Financial Conduct Authority. So in particular, we've been using predictive models to understand which, um, uh, which firms or people within firms had likely done um, you know, bad things that we should uh, try to discover more about. 
Uh, that took me on to the Competition Markets Authority, where um, a lot of what we've been, as I joined about four years ago, uh, a lot of that is just trying to um, understand um, uh, and also use technology. So as we'll all be well aware of, uh, the large technology firms have been uh, particularly active uh, in the long, in the uh, 10 to 15, last 10 to 15 years, and authorities are really now starting to grapple with a lot of those issues. Um, so we're, one aspect of that is dealing with artificial intelligence and how we should be um, thinking about regulating firms' use of that and working with uh, our sister agencies when we do that. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Ming Tang. I'm the Chief Data Analytics Officer for Energies England. Um, therefore, and in that role, I... I'm responsible for most of our data and analytical activities across the NHS. Um, started my career as a pharmacist, didn't really work in pharmacy for long. I joined um, a pharma company and worked largely in operations and then um, in new product introduction. How do we increase our control? I then spent kind of 12 years in consultancy and strategic consultancy. Um, and in there, we did lots of optimization type of problems on very large global companies. And I was just saying to the guys earlier on, one of the really interesting uh, problems we were trying to solve with statistical models was around optimization of milk in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, 90% of their milk is produced in three months of the year. They then need to make decisions about what to do with that milk in order to get best value out of it. It's um, run as a cooperative uh, and therefore you have to make decisions on where to place the product, what to convert the product in. Do you do is the commodity price good? Is you know, special ingredients so that where the value is? And really, and what's the quality of the milk? Can you convert that milk into the right ingredients? And where do you place the product according to the commodity price around the world? Um, they distribute it to 180 countries around the world. So very much multifactorial. But a lot of it was working with their traders because at the end of the day, they, they created their business through commodity trading. So it's really understanding the gut of the commodity trader with the intelligence of the modeling that we do and the supply chain and production issues. So very much an integrated team, um, but really providing decision support. Um, I now work in the NHS and for the last Probably six years I've been working on national data products, trying to bring lots of different desperate data sets together so that we can get better, again, decision support for operations. But also we're now starting to think through the use of AI uh, for clinical data. So some of you will have seen the fantastic work that's been done at Moorfields, Guys and St. Thomas's, where they're looking at scanning and how do you train models to then really accelerate the decision support, but also be more accurate in, in terms of um, seeking diseases and diagnosis. But also we're doing quite a lot of work in training those models and testing them to say, actually, are we being, what's the unknown bias in them? How do you actually convert that information into a clinical team and look at both decision-making from the clinical team as well as what the model is saying? So lots and lots of future work. And as we start... You know, the future thing is how do we create the models that give clinical decision support? How do you have a look at a scan when someone's had a hip replacement, for instance? How do you use the technology of the scan to say whether that hip replacement, the pain that the individual's now having, is that because of the procedure? Is it because of the device that we put in, the actual you know, metal work or the um, ceramic piece in, in in the body, is it, or is it actually time to replace it? Or is it something that they're gonna, they need to do through exercise? All of those are decisions that a clinician need, needs to augment their understanding through technology. And how do you actually provide the guidance and the guardrails around those decisions so you don't do harm? That's really um, our challenge going forward. And as we start, playing with genomic data and, and how do you actually then get precision prescribing, that's going to be a really exciting um, area for, for both data and also the way that we apply these models. All of this is in the context of both driving the best use of computing powers, 
but also how do you put the human decision making around it to support those things? And therefore, how do you get multidisciplinary teams that you were talking about? We always um, create our products with multidisciplinary teams, and a lot of it is actually about adoption and creating a narrative. Where is the value from what you're trying to derive? That's not just the mathematical skills, not to, you know, that is very much a social science skill. And how do you apply that thinking? Which lens of value are you driving for? And who's the user? And you know, who benefits? So a lot of that, and then I guess nudging technology as well for health, it's really important. So how do you persuade someone to take more accountability for their own health in, in the prevention space. And a lot of that is we're doing quite a lot of um, experimentation in nudge theory as well, and how do we apply that to the models of care that we're driving. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so much to discuss, and so really um, important issues that you just raised there were ethically, regulatory, privacy, um, and making effective use of data science. So let Here's what I'd like to do. I would like to talk a little bit about what social science is doing for data science. Um, and we'll start with our public policy side with Stefan and Ming, and then we'll talk a little bit about private sector, and then we'll bring that back to the academic side and flip the question around of what data science, uh, what we need to be doing as social scientists to, to learn and update our data science skills. So Stefan, you, you, you made a very modest set of statements there about when you joined this the Financial Conduct Authority and the CMA and data science. But my understanding is you actually built those teams. So you, yeah. you basically created the data science team at the FCA and then built one at the Competition Markets Authority. Your own background is from social sciences. So in recruiting these teams and seeing what was effective, what, how much did the social science skills of your teams contribute? And how did you, what did you look for in terms of characteristics when you were putting those teams together? Okay. Um, so the, the the social sciences are a, have been a core part of those teams, uh, especially when I was at the the financial conduct authority. Uh, initially, it was the economist doing a lot of the analytics, so yeah, we had to kind of build from that uh, base. Um, I also strongly uh, agree. It's basically, we also need uh, very much a, a lab model. We need to really give bench strength diversity in our skills. So we have, it's not just data science, it's very much data engineering. We also need a lot of what we deal with is trying to understand uh, various technology markets. That might be digital advertising, or maybe it's consumer internet things. So we also need people who are really um, technologically uh, skilled and understanding, but are primarily working in the qualitative domain as opposed to the quantitative. Um, and then we also have, uh, we actually have a behavioural science team as well. So, um, so we have this whole mix of skills that we need in order to <coughs> problem solve. Um, so uh, definitely one of the first things that you know, can be no surprise, we want people who are very sound technically. Um, so we're looking on the data science side for people who've got really demonstrable data science and machine learning experience, but not necessarily book experience, right? They can quote all the various different models that might be applicable in a different situation. What we're really looking for is people that uh, can that understand data science well, but ideally have some really good practical experience in dealing with the, uh, at least every, every day set I've ever dealt with is messy. Uh, and uh, often times uh, when we're trying to work on something, actually it's, it's either slightly vague and unclear or at least somewhat difficult in order to, so we want people who can, can deal with that. Um, very unsurprisingly, we also want people who are going to be very good at coding. So um, we actually, we originally took people who are both good at R and Python. We actually have moved just to Python now. It's just because it's just easier internally if we're all working with Python. Um, there's very importantly with the technical side of things is, and I'm sure this is going to be true for everyone else as well, it's just the ability to understand and talk with our various clients. Uh, often our clients are actually our internal partners, but we want a good customer mindset. And communicating with the technical knowledge in non-technical ways can be really important, especially for a lot of what we do um, effectively as, as part of a legal case. So ultimately we need to, have to explain to lawyers and potentially explain, you have to explain to judges what's going on and that's going to be a very important part of how we work. Um, absolutely looking for people with initiative and ideas. Uh, we hired this uh, 
incredibly talented uh, young chap with a, a PhD uh, in computer science recently, and he's uh, just you know, got so many new ideas of things that we could do. Uh, you know, mixing in absolutely. So, for example, that we're trying to detect dark patterns, scraping data from various different websites. You had to detect dark patterns. So, again, a really good mix of computer principles and social sciences as well. Um, for us, for us um, last uh, is very much engaged in our mission as well. So, as you can imagine, with if um, so, I uh, joined just over four years ago to CMA, and I was employee number one. Uh, we're, we're around about fifty now, fifty and sixty by the end of the year. And um, we want people who are not only engaged at a high level with the idea that we're trying to deal with um, mostly large technology firms, uh, but also day to day. What does that really mean in practice? Um, so we're so we're very much looking for people who, are, who are, want to be part of that program. Very good. And two important takeaways I hear there that we focus, we emphasize at the LSE is um, communication and explaining. You mentioned explaining to judges, explaining to policymakers and communication skills. Um, in our data science modules, for example, we have group projects where they students have to do multiple presentations to the class and to the instructors, because if you can't communicate your results, what good are they? So Ming, I would like to hear your answer to the same question and whether you think that Stefan's emphasis on the importance of social science skills and how they contribute is really due to the fact that he's working in a human science field rather than something technical like health where you deal with hip replacements rather than looking for broad or financial. Um, it's actually very similar. Um, so. What we look at is obviously people coming in with the technical skills, robust technical skills, and we can kind of test for that and ask that question. Most important to me is I select based on more human factors. You know, can that person communicate? Are they flexible? Are they adaptable? Do they want to learn? Are they curious? And actually, we we interview for that in, in, in a competency type frame, framework of an interview and do the team because we have yeah lots of economists we have OR we have statisticians we have a real broad um, spectrum and we have data engineers and, and those skills are very short addiction engineers um, but actually it's really can you team because we deliver projects through multidisciplinary teams so each one actually uh, really recognizing the skill set of the other people in the team and how you can build on strength. So we talk a lot about building on strength so that you, you bring the best of your side to work each day. And that's really important. And that's, that's a very really soft thing. So for us, some of our analysts are actually working very much closely with senior executives. You don't really understand the model, don't want to understand the model and quite often are quite prejudiced in the type of questions that they ask. Um, so the skill of what we want is people that can actually help hold the hand of those um, senior executives and help them ask the right questions so that we build the products that answer the right questions, because um, that's actually a big part of the challenge. Now with clinicians, um, we all have social biases, don't we? We all think that you know, what we understand the world to be is the right way. Part of what my team do is actually put truth to, truth to power and very much set out in a very non-threatening way. This is what the data says. <laughs> this is what the analysis says. And these are the assumptions that we've made. Can you help us understand why this is not the case in your mind? Because through that dialogue, and it is through a dialogue, and it's quite often a quite... Um, contentious dialogue but important because through that dialogue you actually understand different perspectives and therefore you can go away and do a better piece of analysis or you can build better models or better scenarios that better describe today because all we, we all know every model is going to be wrong i'll give you an example during covid we had lots of spy M models which there was a perfect epidemiological curve that didn't help us in operations. It didn't help us understand who was going to end up in hospital. All it showed us was prevalence. Right? So we had to convert that signal with other signals of testing, of mobility, of the weather, all sorts of things that we created a, 
a model where we could actually explain what was going on, which what, what, what was actually creating the bias to project three weeks out how many people were actually going to end in, bed, in a hospital bed, what type of hospital bed did they need, was it an oxygenated bed, was it a ventilated bed, or was it just a normal um, general bed, because all of those things matter when you're trying to drive um, efficiency but also effectiveness in hospitals. So real broad spectrum of things. So in that space is not the most technical, best qualified person for modeling. It's actually how do you actually explain what you're trying to do to people that can get it? Because actually a 65% model is probably better with an understanding. It's probably better than a 99% accurate model that nobody uses. Thank you. Uh, I like one of the things you said there about um, it sounded to me like the takeaway was that uh, data scientists or classic hard data scientists maybe provide precise answers to technical questions, but the social scientists might be focusing on whether we're asking the right questions. I could take that from what you said. Um, let's shift this over to the industry side. So Caroline, you are at the R squared factory, which was started by a fairly traditional company. We want to characterize Rolls Royce Land Rover that way. Um, and my understanding is that this, this R squared factory was launched internally in order to uh, help innovation in the company. And it became so successful that it became an incubator model for innovation teams in other industries or maybe related traditional industries that were seeking transformation. So my question is, um, when you have this process to, as your mission to help companies adapt and innovate, what role is data science playing in this process? And is there an element for social sciences that's helping that process? Yeah, so I, I guess I'd start by, by just saying, our focus is on industrial clients. So we focus on organizations that are you know, asset intensive, they have lots of physical stuff that exists in the world. They're generally mission critical, um, and sometimes they're safety critical. So they might be in healthcare, they might be in pharmaceuticals, they might be in mining, they might be in fuel and power generation, they might be in utilities, they might be in manufacturing and engineering. Um, and they're very people dominated. So they have an awful lot of human intelligence operating in their businesses. Much of what they do is based on um, tr traditional models of developing expertise that are, are predicated on, on tacit knowledge and the transfer of that tacit knowledge between human beings. So that's the kind of context. And what we're trying to do with those organizations is help them understand how they can unlock value, how they can transform the way that they operate using machine learning and AI to make them able to continue being successful in an entirely new set of operating parameters and with an entirely new set of challenges, including how do they, for example, uh, change the way that they consume energy and the amount of carbon that they generate in order to stop having what is potentially a devastating impact on our world because they tend to be doing things like melting steel or trying to uh, generate enormous amounts of energy to support the consumption generated uh, required by data centers, uh, for example, some irony there. Um, now, what's interesting about applying ML in those use cases is, predominantly speaking, those sorts of organizations suffer from three big areas of challenge. The first is most of them are more than 50 years old. So for most of them, their data is in the most appalling condition possible. It is siloed, it is inaccessible, it is hidden in paper, it's locked away in engineering drawings or mathematical notations or science, scientific and chemistry. Um, it's uh, tied up in, in silos that are attached to multiple acquisitions over decades and decades and decades where nobody bothered to actually get in and integrate the, the IT systems. Or, do you know what, it was just collected at a time when nobody ever realised it was going to be needed to be used for an ML model, so it's just not in the right shape. So that's the first problem. Have you got the right data to be able to do data science at all? And then the second problem they face is they can't afford the data scientists. I mean, it's a great bright future for many of you. You know, you've got this fabulous combination potentially of data science and social science. You're going to be able to go out there and command astronomical salaries from all sorts of terribly exciting organizations. But what that means is that the industrial giants who, who drove our, our globe forward over the last 200 years really placed in a pinch point. They can't afford the kinds of skills that you have. They have to grow their own. 
And that leads me to the third question, which is actually the biggest problem facing the use of ML and AI to unlock value for industrial use cases isn't how good the data is and the data is dreadful. It isn't how good the data science is and it's hard to afford the data science. It's how well prepared your organization is operationally to integrate artificial intelligence processes alongside human processes. And that means that psychology and the kinds of social science that actually help to support and generate cultural transformation inside organizations is by far the largest problems those organizations face. So when you look at the work we do in the R-squared factory, we have both a technical capability, which is based around my data science team, who we make available on a collaborative model so that they're much more affordable to our customers. But we also have a cultural transformation team, which is, is headed up by educational psychologists. And our cultural transformation team works with our customers to help them to change the mindset of their organization so that they're actually able to derive the value from the models and the analytics and the insights that those models generate. And that is so important because if you haven't done that sociological, cultural change, that psychological change, you might as well, even if you have the best data in the world and the best data science team in the world, lock them away in a room with a mountain of 50 pound notes and a box of matches because they are not going to release value from your organization unless you do that psychological change first. That's really interesting to talk about this cultural transformation. And that's a good introduction for what I want to ask to Helen about cultural transformation. And you can tell me about two aspects of this cultural transformation. So first of all, was there much of a cultural transformation required, for example, at Turing to get the policy team set up and for uh, a role for social sciences to be carved out? And also, um, uh, before we open up to questions, I would like to talk a little bit about this theme of what what do we need to do in terms of cultural transformation in the social sciences in order to bring data science more widely into our repertoire? Sure. So, yeah, starting with um, uh, the, the, the Turing, and I, 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 I guess I, I mean, there's lots of things, but I guess I guess I point to two. One of them is that, um, and I don't think we talk about this so often, but what a social scientist we're good at is um, kind of defining concepts, defining normative con concepts. We're sort of comfortable with that. And um, I, I'll illustrate this with a quick story. I was giving a talk on, um, on hate speech and detecting, measuring, and countering hate speech, which is something we do a lot of work on. I was talking at a sort of computational social science conference, a lot of mathematicians and um, uh, engineers, computer scientists there. And um, after my talk, this mathematician stood up and said, yes, but, but when you talk about, you know, detecting hate speech online or, or measuring it, you have, to, you have to decide what hate is. And that's a normative concept. And he said it as if I just picked up a sort of basket of rotting fish and dumped it on the lectern. He was horrified by this. <laughs> And it really made me think because I thought, well, yes, and that's OK. You know, we can think about that because as social scientists, we are used to thinking, you know, what, what is hate? What is democracy? We, we spend a very long time thinking about these things. And I do think that these subjects know this. I mean, if you talk to the big tech companies, for example, about how they define um, hate, things like hate speech, it's often very naive, very uninformed by any sort of analytical rigor. So I do think that's one point. Another point is that several people have mentioned about um, ethics. So data science and AI get a lot of stick for all the sort of ethical controversies they introduce um, into um, public policy in particular. But um, they also, I believe, you know, perform a, a useful function in that they highlight very long-standing biases in administrative processes. If you introduce um, some machine learning algorithm and try and do kind of predictive policing or, 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 or risk-based sentencing, for example, as that's being done um, in the US and, and over here, um, any, uh, you, you're likely to sort of inject bias 
into the situation just because you have to use training data and the training data is coming from bias processes in the past. This is why it's so difficult. That's why Amazon dropped their hiring algorithm after working on it for five years, which turned out to be more biased than their um, existing processes because it was using biased data. And what that's doing is it's highlighting that things were, that were always wrong that we're always wrong in our systems of administration. So there's very exciting to me, holy grail there, of actually being able to reveal very long-standing problems and making us think again about how we make decisions, um, which is something that, that, that data science is, is um, very helpful for. What was the second question? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> cultural transformation. Uh, yeah, well, I just want to, I love that point that you make that basically the, by tr training a company like Amazon has access to all the data in the world, but that's the world that was, it's not the world that we want to become. So having social scientists to ask those questions about the difference between the past and the present and the future uh, is really important. important. The yeah. second part, sorry. Yeah, I mean, one good point there, I think, is also the kind of thing we do at the Oxford Internet Institute. We think a lot, and I'm sure lots of you are thinking a lot, about how and that sort of algorithm-infused society changes, um, changes human behaviour, you know, how the algorithms shape human behaviour. To be able to tackle that question, you need to be able to, you, you need some kind of knowledge and understanding of how humans behave, which is what the other is all about. Yeah, sorry, the second question. Well, the second part of the question was, what do the social sciences need in terms of cultural transformation to, in, to, a, to more fully embrace the data science future? Well, it's a big question. I mean, there are some things that sort of data science is good at, which social science has traditionally been bad at, or at least needs to kind of revamp. I'll give you an example. One of those things is measurement. So data science is good for measurement, it's good for detection and it's good for measurement. Um, machine learning is, is, is good for that. Um, but if you think about the way that we measure some things, um, take inflation, take the consumer price index. Um, I'm sure many of you know that fell into many problems during the pandemic because you know some of the measurement of that relied on sort of physical stores, which was completely you know people going to physical stores and working out what you, you know a basket of shopping costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, things that uh, could be um, potentially done in a data science way. Google has been working on a kind of Google price index for years. Um, but we're kind of, we use 20th century data and 20th century measurement methods to, to, to measure things, which we could completely rethink. And uh, we get kind of locked in. We get locked in to, um, uh, to, to kind of ways of measuring things and we have to go on measuring it like that for purposes of comparison. And I think it needs quite a transformative way about thinking like me measurements, like inflation, like GDP, and making the most use of contemporary data and contemporary methods. Thank you. So we got good news and bad news. The bad news is I'm gonna delay you from the drinks reception for an additional 10 minutes to reflect the introduction to the DSI that I spoke about. The good news is we have that much more time for audience questions. So, um, we, uh, I think we're privileged to be here in what we call IRL or in real life. It's wonderful to be starting this school year this way. Let me tell you how great it is. I know the students love that. You can see it. You can see it on the plaza. You can see it everywhere. Um, but let's start with the people who are online. So Dave, do we have any questions from the online audience? Okay. Well, uh, then, then we'll take the IRL questions. Who would like to pose a question to our brilliant panel? Yes. And please do introduce yourself. And we do have a we do have a microphone. I think we can give so that you would be your your voice would be heard and also recorded for all time on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it was the gentleman oh, here. Yes. Sorry. It's chat. Uh, Richard Nesbitt, and I uh, graduated here in '86, a long time ago. Um, the uh, I'm from banking, okay? So this may be for Caroline or Stefan. Uh, what, and I work with a company in Israel that brings the uh, monitoring of AI models into 
financial services companies to check what the AI models are doing in a real-time basis. And what I have found out, as we've talked to various banks, is the banks are really rudimentary in AI. Like, when I think of AI, I think of a model that actually learns and changes and evolves over time. And so you need a model to evaluate what it's doing a year from now versus when you started. That's not what's happening at all. They're not doing anything. You know, what they're doing, you could still do in an Excel spreadsheet. What's your experience with uh, industrial companies or or with banks, Stefan? Like, like they just seem to be nowhere in this AI. And it is AI just like blockchain? A lot of talk, but no action. Over you. That's a really good question. I can't speak to the banking community, thankfully, because uh, you'd be much better qualified to answer the question there. But from an industrial perspective, um, I think it's extremely variable. So one of the things that's been an interesting development uh, from Rolls-Royce back in um, December of 2019, we we brought out, um, and we published it at the end of 2020, but uh, we brought it out at the end of 2019, our AI trustworthiness and um, an ethics framework, which is called the Alethea framework, the Alethea being the, the goddess of truth. And we developed that for exactly the reason that you're articulating, right? So we have been working in what we call engine health on three Rolls Royce. This is where we look at, um, in our civil aviation business, for example, 11,000 uh, airplanes in the sky at any one time. We are, we are tracking 26 independent variables. We use um, a, a uh, neural network and a, and a deep learning model to be able to spot emergent signatures of potential failure. And in order to make sure that that model is in its learning cycles, is not suffering from algorithmic drift, i.e. the recommendations that it's making to humans are still trustworthy and safe, we need to put in continuous monitoring. We need an entirely synthetic airline of data, which we pump through the system every 15 minutes so that we can measure whether the recommendations of the ML model are still within the scope of what would be understood to be credible in the realm of physics based on our synthetic airline data. Um, we need to be able to validate that the input data is not subject to bias and that the output data is within a certain performance range of parameters. All of those things happen because we in Rolls-Royce operate in a safety critical context. And the service that we're offering there, although it, it, it's still... Um, ultimately judged by human beings as to whether an action is taken. So humans still in the loop all the way in that service. That service is still is, is actually regulated by EASA to say so the European uh, Aviation Safety Authority to make sure that the recommendations that are being made can be trusted in what is a highly critical context. I think the underlying problem you're calling out is that for many organizations, the machine learning and AI that they have been developing frankly isn't mission critical enough. They have not asked themselves hard enough questions. What concerns me is where there are industries where the outputs or the outcomes may in fact be genuinely quite challenging or even dangerous. And those questions about safety criticality have not been asked. So I, I acknowledge that the issue you're raising, I think when organizations don't do that cultural transformation to understand that they're actually introducing a whole new set of decision making and sometimes autonomous decision making procedures into their operating reality. If they haven't understood that that's what they're actually doing, that's the road they're going on. They may not have put in the kind of rigor to be able to allow those, those models to, to actually really make transformation. So on financial services, it was uh, just after my time, about a year after I left the FCA, the FCA and the Bank of England published, um, uh, they surveyed a whole bunch of financial services firms in a bunch of different sectors. And then there very much is stuff being used. Uh, it's just, at least from my perspective, much less developed than I would have expected. Um, so there's also quite a bit of variation for different, across different firms. Um, my guess is there's probably still variation even in, even amongst large firms, for example. Um, I don't personally have any experience of that. There's certainly, uh, as you'll be very aware, there's untold fintechs using um, <coughs> um, uh, modelling as well. So there's, so, so there's stuff going on, but yeah, financial services, 
mostly very cautious. A lot of it's very cautious. Part of that is the internal, part of that is going to be regulation as well. Um, now, very much with that in mind, um, so the FCA have been real pioneers in, they've uh, got something called Sandbox, where basically firms want to be working on new technology, they can do it sort of effectively under the auspices of the FCA and, and get some support uh, to be developing those things. That's something the FCA has been incredibly, they've been world leading at um, pushing forward. So, um, yeah, I think there is quite a bit out there. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the latest details of what's going on in financial services. I haven't been in the industry for a few years. Um, but um, quite a bit of variation as well. Thank you. Um, um, hi, I'm Angela Spathara. I'm actually a member of the council here at the LSE, and I had the pleasure of being involved with the early discussions around the Data Science Institute a few years ago. I also lead IBM's team for healthcare for EMEA for Europe, Middle East and Africa. So I guess two questions that might seem a little bit left field, but are very top of mind for me and my team and in my capacity as a council member at the LSE, which is as we invest in data science and trying to bring it in particular in different types of services, public services and so forth, how can we make it more focused on the end user, more user friendly in a way that people engage with data science, engage with the outputs of data science, see the value, don't have fear in engaging and actually end up acting in a way that benefits society. So that's one. And the second question is, as we bring more and more data together, and I know Ming and the team and others have done a lot of work on that, how do we um, establish the right level of trust and maintain that trust and are worthy of that trust so that society again can see the value in, in a non-fear environment? I mean, I think you'd be excellent to answer this question because an area where we absolutely have to have trust, um, not just societally, but individually because of things that we're literally injecting into our bodies would be healthcare. So um, during COVID, where we kind of established a number of machine learning models, one of the things we did was um, to bring a business process around the model outputs. So we put in the cadence of, yeah, at some point in the pandemic, it was daily, sometimes it was weekly, where we brought together the decision makers that would need to kind of signal to the rest of the health service what they need to do. And there was a call where our analysts actually kind of presented what the model was saying, how, how, you know, whether, whether they thought there was bias in the model, whether the model was changing, all the parameters that we were looking for, but also the explainability bit, which was actually the model's taking most value or being influenced mostly by these factors. So we kind of had all of that set out. What was really interesting for me is by bringing that business process together, the individuals that were making decisions of so what were then triangulating it with their other calls that they were having, you know, the sit reps they were having with trusts um, in regions and all sorts of people, as well as nuances with you know, discussions with SPIM, with government, public health, all of those things. And then they were saying, actually, we recognise what the model is saying, or we don't recognise it. And actually, this is how we're going to decide. And what, what, what's the action? Do we check it again in two days' time? Because that might, you know, we're making a risk decision. Or do we actually believe in it and we tell the whole system to say, you now need to clear so many beds because this is coming along. And we had instances of both of those kind of scenarios. But that process is what we now try and use against all our modeling outputs. And in fact, we try and put a wrap a business process around any of our analytical projects now um, so that both it has that dialogue, trains people to use it, trains people to trust it, and because you're doing it on a regular basis, it just becomes part of the way that you do work, right? So I think in the past, sometimes models have been put on a pedestal. <laughs> the data science team says this, and then nobody, everyone goes around saying, oh, I don't know, you know I don't want to change what I'm doing because I'm comfortable with what I'm doing. Forcing the business process around it, making it transparent is, is part of it. That transparency then actually goes to the public trust piece, which is really difficult for the NHS because the data is really dirty. It's really dirty because we didn't invest in consistent systems that had were interoperable. So lots, you know, you might have uh, instances of electronic patient records on the same product, 
different instances were delivered in different ways. So the definitions of the data is, is quite difficult. And, and therefore, we have to do a lot of um, processing and transforming that data. Lots of hospitals don't even have proper electronic patient records. So you're taking data from activity systems, what we call past systems. So it's really counting how many people are in beds rather than what's happening to them. Um, so trying to mix that data. But what we've separated out is what's operationally data, what's directionally correct for operations versus statistical data that is published, which then says whether we're going right or wrong. The other thing we've introduced is um, a long-term longitudinal study of data, which is looking at segmentation of people's health, which then allows us to know that you know, over the last 10 years, this is what's proportion of individuals that are healthy well versus having one long-term condition or three long-term conditions. And we can measure the transition from healthy to long-term condition, and that then helps inform what, how we drive our improvements to health. So the public engagement on health data is very politicised. There's lots of lobby groups that don't want that data sharing. Clinicians who are really scared as they're the data controllers and therefore, you know, with the ICO that has impact on what they can or not release. Um, and us in the Nations England wanted to use all that data to, to build that product. So quite political, um, but Again, it's through dialogue and through actually being more transparent about how the data is being used. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask, and you might, some of you might know the answer to this question, so if you do, don't spoil the surprise for everybody else in the room. But would anyone like to have a guess with me when the first reference to an artificially intelligent system uh, is, 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 it became brought to public attention? Anyone want to guess the 21st century? 1920s. 1920s, anything earlier than 1920s? It was a science fiction movie in the 50s. The 50s, anything earlier than the 50s? We've got the 20s already, anything else? Uh, Leibniz. Sorry? Leibniz. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, anything Anything else? Shall I give you the answer? 7,000 BC. Oh. <laughs> so Homer referenced Hephaestus' assistance in the Iliad, which by any definition of what we understand to be an artificially intelligent autonomous assistant, that's exactly what they were. And my point is, we've been living with these ideas for a phenomenally long time. And I think if we bring that multidisciplinary conversation together with all of the parts of our experience, our cultural experience, not right, and we bring our artists and our musicians and our writers to bear at the same time as we bring our data scientists and our social scientists, I think we'll have more fruitful discussions, hopefully discussions that aren't simply predicated on dystopian visions of how the robots are going to take over the world. So, so that's my, my answer to your question about engagement. I realise I've simply opened up an enormous and never-ending challenge of how we tell these stories to each other, but we have been talking about these stories for thousands and thousands of years. Helen. I just wanted to add a note of, uh, of, of, of hope. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, as I said before, I wrote my PhD about information technology and government. And at the time that I wrote my thesis, nobody was interested in that topic. Nobody in the LSC senior common room was interested. Um, uh, nobody in government was interested. Most people were just trying to keep away from any technology because they didn't want to get their careers dirty by having a failed technology project. And the one thing that's made me, when, I, when we set up the public policy programme with the Turing, I was really kind of nervous because I thought, well, this might just get completely ignored. It might go nowhere. Um, but actually, there's been huge interest. We've got far more interest than we can we can cope with. Um, and that is a positive thing, I think, because it means that policymakers are really at least thinking about what they might do with this stuff and how public services might be better with this stuff. Um, and, and, and that is quite exciting. I think we've, we've got a graph of it somewhere. I think there were uh, last year there were 350 mentions of artificial intelligence in government announcements and ministerial uh, announcements and, and government documents. So, you know, uh, the, there is there is an enthusiasm kind of within parts of uh, society that really were very resistant to technological change in the past. So that is some something to be hopeful about. <laughs> 
I wonder if, uh, if you're a student, would you would you rather trust a potentially biased and error prone human being to mark your assignments, or would you prefer to have an AI do it? I think the answer is whichever one gives a high grade. <laughs> I am we we eagerly await the AI versions. Eric, I believe you had a hand up. Hi, Erica Thompson from the LSE Data Science Institute. Um, I wanted to ask about the risks. You know, I think uh, data science is really fashionable and people are barreling towards implementing it in all sorts of places, as the panel have already mentioned. And perhaps one of the problems is that the feedback from getting it wrong doesn't come back quickly enough and it doesn't come back to the right people. It doesn't necessarily come back to the team that are implementing that. Um, so I wondered what sorts of checks and balances you feel are needed within the system. I think we see a lot of people writing reports about you know, perhaps the need for caution and the need to integrate ethics. Um, but to what extent is that being implemented? What does it look like operationally when a, a company or an organization does that well? I liked what Ming was saying about the um, business processes surrounding the use of models operationally within the NHS. I think that sounds great, but it's not something that I see happening more widely. Maybe the panel, could, the rest of the panel could say a bit more about whether that kind of, you know, nuanced uptake of these kinds of models is happening well in other sectors. If there's any examples of best practice you might point to. And I would, I might add, that's a really good question. And it, is there a censorship effect where we tend to hear more about failures and more about successes? I would say there's certainly a self censorship process where many people feel uncomfortable talking about failures, and I think we have to challenge that. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to oversight the best practice that we've worked on. But if anyone wants to look at the Elite framework, it's available from the Rolls Royce website. Please, please um, do help yourselves. Um, it's open source, so anyone can use it in any way they wish. Um, I would say that, and it's interesting, when we were talking about this a little bit before, one of the challenges we have worked very hard on our, uh, uh, from the R-squared Factory's perspective um, over the last two or three years is trying to broaden the conversation around AI ethics out from what's predominantly been a conversation about fairness, which is incredibly important. And I don't wish to underestimate how important it is to have fair models that are not reinforcing that bias that, that Helen talked about before. But we've tried very hard to broaden that conversation out, out from just being about fairness to being about safety. Now, we've got vested interest in doing that because we operate in a safety critical context, right? So we want to make sure that the rigor, the safety awareness and the rigor we impose on our own data science communities is also understood and adopted by others so that we can operate safely within an ecosystem, right? Because we don't only, it's not just us, all of our suppliers need to be, if they're using AI and producing components, whereas they also need to meet those safety critical standards. But it's been a jolly hard slog to get that safety question to the front of regulators' minds, to the front of big tech's minds, to the front of um, all of the people, even the AI Council, frankly, in the UK. It's been a hard job to get that safety question at the front of people's minds. And if we, I think we're getting there. I think it's some really good progress over the last sort of 18 months to two years. But let's not be naive about this. We are facing into a 50 year period where at some point over the next five decades, we will have a significant minority of autonomous controlled vehicles on our roads alongside human controlled vehicles. Now it won't be the autonomously controlled vehicles that create the problem in that scenario, but the problem will still be there. So we need to understand when we think about control systems for autonomous vehicles, how do we not only make sure that they're safe within the confines of what safety for an autonomous vehicle is, but also safe within the confines of what does it mean to be 28% of the vehicles on the road? Not enough to tip the balance towards safer performance, but enough to really freak out the human drivers. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I totally agree with that. Um, we, we have produced a guide for the... Uh, ethical and safe and ethical use of AI in the public sector. Um, and what we prioritized with that was actually giving practical advice 
There have been so much academic work in this area. Papers, papers about papers, reviews of papers about papers, you know, on and on and on. And um, at some point, you know, there's a lot of agreement among all that work. Fairness, yes. Accountability, yes. Transparency, yes. But I think what's important to remember is that people need kind of practical guidance, developers, designers. They need practical guidance. Um, and you need to remember always that, that AI is a kind of, or data science is a horizontal technology. It gets into everything, could get into everything. So there are some general uh, principles that um, apply to everything, but it's also a vertical that it has different implications in different sectors. You know, in the in uh, Rolls Royce, it's different from in a hospital, and um, so you need you, you need ethical frameworks for all those kind of those situations. And I I feel we do tend to think about it in a very general sense, in rather than thinking about actual specific kind of usage on the, on the ground. Yeah, uh, so um, when we think about risks, there's just a very large number. Uh, so uh, we've got the worst named organisation I'm aware of, but the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, uh, which is the, I got it right for now, uh, the, uh, which is ourselves. Uh, my former employer, the Financial Conduct Authority, uh, Ofcom, uh, the Telecoms Agency, and the Information Commission's Office. And we're all thinking a lot about how do we, um, for, for the best things that we're um, responsible for, what do we need to be focusing on when it comes to AI? So, um, the, so uh, yeah, my team, my organisation published something um, coming up for a couple of years now on how, when you think about competition and consumer protection, what are the issues you need to, uh, or we should be aware of and that we should be thinking about. And in particular, I was, um, I think one thing we have to be aware of, I think sometimes that, um, uh, maybe this is a bit cheeky to say, but sometimes in, in academic circles, I, I'd seen within, within um, the, the academic circle that's closest to me, there's a lot of focus on the idea that um, Pricing algorithms could learn to collude with each other. And, and I actually do think that that is a genuine um, uh, you know, possibility and actually maybe happening in some areas as well. But actually, when we take a step back and try to think, where do we think the problems are most likely to be and what should we most worry about? Or what, or, or even what are the other things we should care about? There was a hell of a lot. And so we really spend a lot of time thinking about those. And we're actively using that knowledge right now to um, to be thinking about which cases to prioritise and also how to take forward cases practically. So involving, so for example, we're doing work on fake and misleading online reviews. We've been doing it for a few years now, but in particular, right now we're focusing on Google and Amazon and their systems for dealing with fake and misleading online reviews. So it's really quite practical hands-on work, given they're quite complex systems. Um, but really importantly, with the three other agencies, we also tried to make sure that we actually had, uh, I think this is the first time I've really seen it um, actually, Helen, Helen would know better than me. First, I've really seen it globally of a, a variety of different agencies really trying to come in detail. Um, so we published something, um, I think it was published in April or May of this year, um, through the DRCF, uh, awfully named thing. Uh, and the, um, so, I, so I think we're making some good headway, but um, there's, there's still a lot to be done. And I think we're going to learn, and we're learning a huge amount from uh, uh, this work on fake and misleading online reviews. There's another antitrust case now we're dealing with some meta and their use of advertising data. And we're, we're really learning a lot about our firm systems for doing Well, I think that brings us up to time. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there, we could continue this discussion indefinitely, and that the purpose of the DSI is to continue this discussion indefinitely. And I see so many of you in the audience I recognize who are also experts in your various fields in either at the LSE or elsewhere. And we could have had some of you up here, um, and we hope to continue this discussion with you. Let me say a few. Uh, first of all, let me thank our panelists. You were absolutely great, and I really, really can't say how much I appreciate you participating in this big day for us at the DSI and for this discussion. I also want to say a thank you to our incredibly hardworking DSI team, Dave, our events and uh, communications and events manager over here who put this together and is responsible for things like you see on the website and the announcements. Lou, are you here? 
Yes, Lou is our business development manager. If you are an outside company and you are contacted by her or the, her colleagues at the Philanthropy and Global Engagement, uh, you probably got some communications with Lou. Mm -hmm. Jill, I don't know if Jill is here. There she is. She is our institute manager and she is responsible for making sure that this whole thing moves along as it should. Um, and John, he is our assistant professor, a lecturer. He led some of the events today, and he's going to be responsible for doing uh, We sort of have our hard work done with today, but John's hard work begins Monday and delivering uh, our education. And if you're a student who will be taking one of his modules, you're making a great choice. The rest of the team, uh, I also um, thank some of the people behind the scenes, but I won't call them out. It will be on YouTube forever. But um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, the panelists, and thank you to LSE for sponsoring this. And now we would like to invite you to our drinks reception, which is, Dave, on the... On the, on the eighth floor terrace. Eighth floor terrace. You get a view as well. And we're fortunate the, the, the weather cooperated. Our backup plan was the lobby, but we'll be out on the terrace. Thank you. Thank you.